thanks to Larry Lane up front for helping with all the production work. And um, he's he's really great to work with. And just as a caveat, if this goes south, uh, Larry Lane did the production work. <laughs> <laughs> so just a couple of preliminary comments. So I, I think most of you are very familiar with Max Silva, but in case there's someone on tonight who's not, Max was a longtime scouter in New Hampshire. Uh, in 1950, he was the uh, chair of the Jamboree committee that sent in New Hampshire sent four troops. And in that that specific year, Max decided um, that the New Hampshire boys were going to have friendship gifts to bring to the National Jamboree. And he designed and had produced a belt buckle. These were done in bronze. Each boy received four of buckles. And he also produced three of other additional items that weren't given to boys, but were given out as friendship gifts for other, for, to other persons or places that can help the, the troops along the way. Um, the, uh, the buckles have become a very significant collector's item. I should remember the number, but I think it's something like 54 or 57 buckles that were produced over the years. Uh, and I would just remind everybody that Max gave these out as friendship gifts. Translation, Max Silver personally funded these buckles for every Jamboree and international event. And he made sure the boys from New England or New Hampshire who, um, would have a buckle. Um, they'd get two buckles after the first one. They, he gave out two buckles to each boy, one for them to keep as their own personal memento and one to trade. And the truth is, they also became very desirable by by people he knew in the, in the scouting community over the years. And so leading into this, so in fact, when I was preparing the, to do the first part, um, when I thought it was only going to be one part, um, I went to the museum at Carpenter and I just said to Dick, I said, you know, I'd like to really see what's in the museum collection. So he took me up to the warehouse and he pulled out boxes and then he pulled out another box and he pulled out another box. And I kept seeing things I'd never seen before. And I realized fairly quickly that what I was looking at was not the usual type of product or scouting work. And I wanted to know more about it. So that's when I decided we would do a second part. And I went to Bronzecraft which is in Nashville, New Hampshire. Max was a metals dealer. Uh, Kaminsky Brothers was the company name. And um, he would work with a variety of different companies who needed metals. Bronzecraft is actually a high-end company. Um, the work we're going to see today, just so you know, are not the work of, they're not doing Max Silver Buckles because they, we don't produce Max Silver Buckles anymore. But in fact, the Steinway piano pieces. They were they were doing some work for the Steinway company, and uh, and so it was interesting to see see that side of the operation. So we're going to actually get a backdoor look at how the process itself of how the buckles would be produced. We're looking at one of the the uh, machines where they actually make the molds. This is actually the process here is actually after the piece is cast and cooled. They they send it through this machine, uh, and they break out the piece out of the mold. They they use a, a special uh, formula of say clan say depending on the metals they're using, and then they recycle the sand. The one thing that was really amazing in that this whole process is this place is actually really clean for a manufacturing facility, and the other thing I noticed. Nobody lifts anything, pretty much. Uh, everything is, you can see the belt in the back. That's actually have, has brought, he's going to send that down the line to where they actually do the finishing of the product. So what you're wa looking at here is that little tray actually uh, after the, the um, casting of, is made for the piece it's in the sand, it goes on... I think we're going to get a picture of, of the whole thing here in a second. Yeah, it goes on this line and it comes down at the back right. The Those uh, little squares come down. Those actually hold the molds. And the molds are then put on this tray that's that we saw moving. And they just kind of circulate around. So what we're looking at here is the actual melt, <clears throat> the actual melting. So the, what they're doing, the gentleman who just pulled, put that piece in to the fire, he was actually test 
taking the temperature. Uh, th this particular day, they were firing at 2,500 degrees, uh, which is the highest they do go. It's a special kind of metal. It's an alloy, kind of like a stainless steel, but not quite. Uh, and that's what they, they were actually pouring that day. Um, and uh, they're, they're getting ready to actually move the, the pot that they were heating in that that pot is at 2,500 degrees he's moving here. And he's pulling it down to where the molds are themselves are sitting. This is where the molds sit. The unfortunate thing, I think over the years, nobody ever saw this process. None of the people I know in scouting ever saw this process. And uh, you can see how white that that molten metal is, and he's going to pour it here. And and there's no protection between me and them. And truthfully, I don't even feel the heat when I'm there. I'm not even feeling the heat of that, unless you got real, real close. But even as close as I am, I never really felt the heat. The building was actually comfortably warm that day, all they had going was fans. So that's, that's actually the mold itself. So this is, this is actually the former owner of the company. His son-in-law, Jim, is actually the, um, the current operator of the plant, but it's a three generations uh, in family uh, that's in, in this business. And he actually pulled off, I think in the next picture, these were the actual molds for the eagle buckle that the, that the um, museum sells. I asked them where the other molds were, and they said they have a basement. Um, they're very particular, and, and I checked out a little bit on this to make sure. No one can ever reproduce those buckles unless they're officially approved by whoever whoever owns the mold. So in this case, and now it would be probably the museum owns the molds, and those buckles are never, never going to be reproduced. And there's always been a question, I think, in some people's minds that Max would uh, order up the buckles for the jamborees and the order in those buckles would probably range somewhere between 400 and a and thousand on a specific jamboree depending on how many kids were going and how many buckles he was going to give away they were only run once there was no second run on these buckles the only buckles that get reproduced are the ones that museum sells for fundraising the eagle buckle the oa buckle silver beaver buckle and the wood badge buckle. I believe those are the only ones that are actually ever reproduced. So these are what I saw at the warehouse and the museum. On the top left, we're looking at was actually a, a wooden carved image of the buckle. The, to the right, um, the green piece you're seeing is actually in a plastic kind of material. Now, I don't, I don't know it's plastic as we know it today because um, that the form of plastic we use today wasn't actually created until 1957 in Lemonster, Massachusetts, but it is a similar kind of product. The red, the red one is also a similar kind of plastic product. Actually, the the one on the right that was done for the 100th anniversary of scouting. So in fact, that is a plastic. And these were actually, I'm going to read you what Jim wrote me because I couldn't get a clarification from his father-in-law. But he said that the, the brown and red pieces um, looks like carvings. Uh, some of the other pictures, he said, are photo engravings used to make a multi-impression pattern plate. And he said the photo engravings provide a better detail than the duplication of the master. So these are the original plates that are used to make the mold. I think we can, and then you're going to see some other more interesting ones. These are in metal, and there are a couple different kinds of metal. The top left is the 50 uh, the Colorado. That's the 60 Jamboree two-piece. Um, I don't have, they didn't have an example of this, of the uh, connecting piece that goes in the middle. Um, but these, again, these are, these are one of a kind. I don't believe there are any duplications of these out there because these are master patterns. I think this, the pictures are self-explanatory. I do want to make, just mention to my friend, Steve Hambleton is on the call tonight. And I just want to make mention that there's the Camp Carpenter uh, buckle, but you can see the, the different styles that were done. The, basically, these are actually, some of these, I think, are aluminum, more of the same. And, and you see the how the these were done. There's the eagle 
buckles and the away buckle, uh, the Explorer buckle, which a lot of people in the, don't see because that, there weren't that many. That, that's actually an uncommon buckle to find, the Explorer one. And you're looking at the backs, the two pictures you're seeing, the fronts and backs of both. Other questions? So this is this was the, the behind the scenes look. Um, I thought I, there was a couple things that did come up in the conversation. I was talking with um, the former owner of the company. He made a comment that I haven't been able to confirm, but he did suggest to me that Bronzecraft was not the only company that made those buckles. And I have had no other knowledge of that. And he even suggested a company in Concord, New Hampshire, as having been also a maker of the buckles, but they had gone out of business um, some years ago. So there's no way of knowing and tracing that. One, somebody wanted to know the average cost of producing each buckle. So what I do know, back in the 90s, I was sitting with Max and we would discuss the buckles from time to time. And he was telling me at that time, an average buckle was costing him $20 to produce. To put this in perspective for you, the number that Max and I came up with using some of the statistics that I had from the museum and discussing, looking at the number of events and stuff, we figured close to 30,000 buckles were produced uh, by Max and given away. I think it's a simple math problem at this point to know the value of what he did uh, to help you know promote scouting and to help boys have a good time. Yeah, Guy Eaton here from Dover. Uh, oh, hi, Guy. Hi. Actually, Max had early buckles made at Nashua Brass. Ah, okay. Well, good. That's the... be, 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 because I, I have a number of Max's buckles. A number of them are made in brass, and a number of them are actually made in bronze. Yep. Because when I worked at Camp Carpenter in the summer of 1771, the rifle range crew had strict instructions to scavenge every 22 shell casing because they all went to max. 